You guys ready to do this? Matthew chapter 3. No intro this week. We're getting right into the scripture. I've given the intro to the book like nine times. If you haven't heard it, go back and listen to either the, any of the previous six sermons. We're in the book of Matthew. We'll be in chapter 3 today. If you've been with us for the last six weeks as he we went through, we spent the last six weeks going for the first two chapters of the book of Matthew. And today in one chapter, in one page turn, we're moving forward in time. Some Somewhere between 27 and 28 years. So Jesus went from little baby infantile Jesus to grown man, grown up Jesus. And these are the things that happen 28 years later. Matthew jumps right from the Magi and the Exodus journey to Egypt and jumps right here to chapter 3. So we're going to start out today. We're going to read this scripture. We're going to be in verses 1 to 12. It will be up on your screen or grab a Bible. I'll be reading from the ESV if you're trying to figure out what I'm saying. Let's jump. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to feast on an incredible passage today. So let's do this. Jesus, we are so blown away that you are a God who chooses us in the midst of our imperfection, in the midst of the moments where we totally miss it. You're a God that calls us continually back to yourself. We're thankful today for John, for the ways in which he pointed to you and the ways in which he'll help us 2,000 years later turn from the ways we're living and choose to follow you instead. Lord, I pray for each person here in person and online, that, that each of us would be filled with the wonder and the beauty and the power of the word spoken. May we be transformed by your scriptures. Lord, I pray against the busyness of life and the foolish distractions that fill our minds. Lord, in this moment, we ask in Jesus' name that they would be set aside and we would be present to hear from you to know you, and to follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and loudly, God's people said, amen. amen. All right, let's get to work. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Before you do anything else, I got a question. Pop it right up on the screen. I want you to look at someone by you, and if you're online, put in the comments. I want you to do this. A answer this question. What is one word or phrase that describes your first impression of John? One word or phrase that describes your first impression, and what's word or f one word or phrase that sticks out to you about his message? You got 30 seconds. Start talking to your neighbors and just go for it. On your market set, go. Do it. Let's go. And if you're sitting by yourself, feel free to move. Deacons. <laughs>
All right, let's hear it. What was the word or phrase that best describes your first impression of John in this passage? Let's hear it. What is a, what? Wild. He's a little bit wild, yes. What else? Animated. Animated, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he's very animated. Yeah, what else? Brave. Brave, all right. Barbarian. Barbarian, all right. Straightforward. He's a bit of a straight shooter, I might. Yeah, anyone here a bit of a straight shooter? Some of you, never mind. Yeah, I know a few people. Are. Anyway, who else? Let's go. What, what other words? When you, when you heard John speak, what other words right away did you associate with him? Strict? Yeah. He's kind of, anyone think, anyone say like intense? Anyone think he was angry? All right, what, maybe not. I'm just asking. What, what other? Give me a couple more, and then we'll move on. Like a mighty warrior. Yes, thank you. Is anyone, okay, I'm just going to just, how many times you see people walking around dressed in camel fur, eating bugs and wild honey, and you flock to them and want to hear what they have to say? If I'm walking down the street and I see John, I'm for sure crossing the street or I'm just turning around and getting away. Is anyone else like completely going to be weirded out by someone like this? I am, yeah, it's not, I, it's not even that weird in California, thank you very much. There's not camels. <laughs> right? But it's, he's kind of, does he seem a bit eccentric? All right. When you shared, what was word, word or phrase from what John said that popped off the page to you? Locus. Yes. He didn't, that's, he, that's gross. Are you just grossed out that he was eating bugs, Joni? Yes, Joni's disgusted that he was eating bugs. Locust. What other things, when you were hearing that, what words were like popping off the page to you? Camel, Camel here. Fire. Yeah, fire's kind of intense, right? You're talking about people being purified and, and being lit on fire is slightly intense. Yes, thank you. What else? What other, what other images really jumped out from the passage, guys? Brood of, brood of vipers. I don't know about you. I've never called someone a brood of vipers. Anyone ever called someone a brood of vipers? I'm going to let you know that wasn't a compliment in case you missed that. <laughs> There's some 2,000 years of distance. That's not a compliment. What else? What other words just as they were read that, that John said that just popped out in this passage? I don't know how many that that you can't even, um, yeah, like someone's coming. Right? There's some expectation in John's word, yes? Some like intense expectation. What else? Give me one or two things. Cut down and thrown in the fire. Cut down and thrown in the fire. Yeah. What else? Give me one more. What? Unquenchable fire. Right? There's an intensity in which John speaks as he's preparing the people for the coming of this person. So I want to let you know who this John is. If you've ever read three, three books past this, the Apostle John, this is not the same person. The Apostle John talks about being beloved and God's love and God's caring, right? This is not the teenager John who Jesus called to be his disciples. I, I just want to let you know, just on an aside, he was for sure like a teenager. He's like 13 to 15 when Jesus called him to be one of his disciples and to build his church. So if you're between 13 and 15, you're like prime age for God to use you to transform the world, just to be clear. So it's not that John. This is John the baptizer. He's not Baptist, all of you, right? He's not like this. He's not like first Baptist team. He's not like John the Baptist, right? He, he was a baptizer and he was out there and he was the son of, of, of a priest named Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth, who was Mary's cousin, and John the Baptist was the very first person while he was in Elizabeth's womb to celebrate and rejoice that Jesus had come. It's this fascinating, beautiful picture that this fetus, this baby in the womb, you read about it in Luke, right? When Mary entered the room, Elizabeth said that, that, that John leapt inside the womb in joyful celebration. So John is Jesus' cousin. I don't know if it's like a first cousin. I don't know exactly how it works after that. 
Like, I don't know what a second cousin is, and I don't care. So don't tell me afterwards, because I for sure won't remember. Right? So it's not the person who wrote John. It's this man who was preaching and teaching. So we're going to work through here. Join with me. We're going to be back in verse 1 and 2. And in verse 1 and 2, Matthew is revealing to us what John's message was to the world. So the question we're going to be asking in these first two verses that we're going to want to answer was, what was John's message? Hear the word of the Lord. Verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I love that out of nowhere, John appears in Matthew's gospel. Anytime you see people in the wilderness, it's one of those moments where bright light should be going. We're going to talk about it a bunch more in two weeks. I'm going to give you the 15 second version. When people are in the wilderness, it's a moment of preparation, whether they were there by choice or something drove them there. It's a moment of preparation for something significant to happen. It's the place where people would go to hear from God and, and, and God would reveal his presence uniquely in wilderness moments. Cutting that off two weeks from now, we're going to talk a whole lot about that. And in verse 2, we have revealed to us the first glimmer of the gospel message coming through John that Jesus would reaffirm as he starts his earthly ministry. John, this bizarrely dressed, wild man, full of passion, is calling people to repent, to turn, and to know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent is a word that Christians use all the time. It's a very simple word. It means a turning from one direction to another, but it's not a mindset or emotion. It's this holistic turn in mind, heart, and action by turning away from sin and disobedience and self and returning to God. And this message that he's proclaiming has an urgency and an intensity to it. He asks the people to turn while there's still time. As Christians for the last 2,000 years, many leaders have talked about repentance as the posture of a follower of Jesus. I'm going to say that one more time. That repentance is the posture that a follower of Jesus takes as they walk through their life. It's this belief that Jesus is right Everyone else is wrong, and I'm going to walk through life, and any time that I believe something that Jesus doesn't, I'm going to turn from my belief, and I'm going to live differently. And we do this as Christians minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, year by year, until the Lord calls us home. It's those moments where we find ourselves outside of God's will, and the Spirit of God corrects us and turns us back on the right course. The Christian life is not defined by our perfection. Look at someone by you and say, you're not perfect. Come on. You're, if you're married, you know this is true, right? You're not perfect, and neither am I. Nobody is, except delusional liars, right? The only people who are perfect, and Jesus, right? He's not a delusional liar. Sorry. So the reality is, right off the bat, John is making this rather intense claim to acknowledge who we truly are. And because we live in a posture of repentance, when we mess up, we don't have to rationalize it, right? We don't have to hide it when we mess up. We don't have to excuse ourselves. We don't have to look around at the people around us and say, mm, at least I'm not as bad as that person. Right? So I'm probably okay. I don't know if anyone else does that other than me. Right? That's a super big struggle for me. The reality at the center of the gospel, whether it's Jesus, whether it's Paul, whether it's Peter or John right here talking about who Jesus is and what he came to be, at the center of it is this posture of repentance that changes everything about how we live. 
So he says, repent. And he says, the kingdom of what is at hand? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm going to let you know, I'm going to talk about this like 50 times over the course of the book of Matthew. Because this whole book is about what happened when the king came and the king stays and the king reigns and changes the world. The reason for this repentance, John says, is that there is a dawning of a new age that comes with the coming of a king whose kingdom will have no end. This word kingdom of heaven, it's talked about a bunch in the Old Testament. It's often when you come across this phrase, day of the Lord, it's synonymously used in the New Testament as kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. And I'm gonna let you know, we're gonna spend a ton of time talking about this. Jesus is gonna use parable after parable after parable later on to teach us what it is. So as we go through Matthew, it's like opening a gift Anyone played that silly game where you like wrap a gift and then you wrap it again and then you wrap it again and again and again and again and again and again and then there's like a gift card in the middle, right? And there's like duct tape layers. It's like this horrific thing, right? Because you really want to get it. The kingdom of God in Matthew is going to be like this. He's just going to reveal layer after layer after layer and unveil God's plan and who Jesus is. And in this moment, he's letting us know that at the core of Jesus is coming is this invitation to live a life of repentance. So that was John's message, was repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. And now we're going to talk about who John is. So pick it up with me in verse 3 and 4, as Matthew tells us who this man is, who's calling us to repentance and new life. Verse 3, for this is he, being John, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I want to let you know, you have wise leaders here. I definitely wanted to bring in crickets and honey. And I had some leaders discourage me from feeding people that. They said, I already fed people baking chocolate in the last year. I should not feed anyone crickets. If I said, finish the, we're going to play a game called finish the phrase real quick. If I said, God so loved the world. All right. If I say, somewhere. Okay. Don't stop. All right. Almost heaven. The three of us feel like that song. All right. <laughs> Amazing grace. All right. This is one of those moments for the first hearers that just like those things that I said, they would have an immediate thought. This is from Isaiah chapter 40. It's one of the most significant passages of the entirety of the Old Testament. So they hear this and they're like, whoa, something serious is happening. Just like when I said journey lyrics and John Denver lyrics to you guys. So here's what happens. I'm going to read a small portion of Isaiah 40 so that you get the context of what Matthew is telling his first readers here, because it is a really, really, really big deal. Here's what he says in verse 3. A voice cries. This is Isaiah chapter 40. If you want to join me, it will be on the screen, or you can join me in your Bible. We'll be looking at verses 3 to 6. If you want to read the full passage, read the whole chapter to get a bigger picture of this incredible promise that Isaiah makes by the power of the Holy Spirit about God's plan to change the world. It says this, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain shall be made low and the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain and the glory of of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall, shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
It goes on to say what the fruit of that person who comes will be, that they're going to bring life and breathe life into a world filled with death and decay. In this moment, we have the prophecy from hundreds of years before that John has come to prepare the way for the person who would shine the glory of the Lord to the world. And he has come to prepare that way in a few distinct ways. So in the ancient Near East, at that time, before a king or royalty would be moving through a land, there would be people who go out in front of them and they would do two things right? Because the king can't go over bumpy ground. They would literally have people making roads in front of them, right? I've been to some of your houses. Some of you all live on dirt roads, right? And it's terrifying to get there. And if I use ways, I don't get there, right? In the ancient world, the roads weren't so awesome, right? So literally in front of kings and queens in the ancient world, they would have workers who would announce that the king and queen is coming and workers who would flatten the ground so that it wouldn't be difficult as they traveled, right? He's using, drawing this imagery from their world by showing them that the person who's preparing this is preparing the way for someone who's a really big deal who will reveal the glory and the presence and the Shekinah glory of God's very self. He was letting people know that the king is coming. And John here is doing the same thing in our passage for Jesus. By showing this way uh, to join the king, uh, John's doing a few things that are really significant. So one of the ways in which right here in our passage, that, that, that John is revealing who Christ is, is he's taking those who are high up and bringing them down. The mountains are brought low before the Lord comes. That those who live in the depths of the valley who are downtrodden and forgotten are brought up. And those places of stumbling in life are washed over. And as Jesus comes, this invitation for repentance is for everybody. For the CEO and for your addicted uncle. For your forgotten neighbor who no one talks to. Right? And the most important person in our town, when Jesus comes... And when John brings this gospel of repentance, it's for all people, for every single one of us. And it flattens the playing field in Jesus's kingdom forever. And we're going to find out later, the whole world will get turned upside down as this king reigns. Because to be powerful, you'll need to be weak. And in order to be first in Jesus's kingdom, you have to be the last And in order to reign like a king in Jesus' kingdom, you need to be, like Ed beautifully defined for me a few months ago, a servant. That the whole slate is getting washed clean. And when we come to Jesus, we come just like everybody else. That all of us come with imperfections and a need to repent. And Jesus welcomes all into his presence who will return from their ways and follow him. It's this great moment where things are made right. And in this moment, John is embracing his purpose and his place as a prophet in Israel. So a vast majority of the Old Testament is written by prophets. And a prophet is simple. It's a mouthpiece of God. It's not a fortune told teller, right? It's not the person you go to, right, who looks in a ball, right, and tells you, like, the lottery numbers, right? A prophet's the person who speaks God's truth into their moment. And a small portion of what they do is for the future, but the vast majority of what a prophet does is for the present. And for 400 years, God has not raised up a prophet to speak on his behalf in Israel. And for the first time in 400 years, There is someone crying out for the people to repent and to return to the Lord. And his clothes might sound funny, but the great prophet Elijah dressed the same way. He's dressed like the great prophet of the Old Testament, who in Malachi was promised to come before the Lord 
returns. If you want to read more about it, in Zechariah 13.4 and in 2 Kings 1.8, it talks about his garb. Anyone think it's just really weird that of all the things Matthew can put in, he put what he ate? Does anyone else find that bizarre besides me? Right? Like of all the things in the world you could write about who Matthew is, why let us know, if you want us to like him and respect him, that he eats bugs and honey? I'm going to tell you why. The poorest of the poor who could not afford food in that space had a diet of two things, locusts and honey that the poorest of the poor in Jerusalem and Judea would walk through the countryside and collect bugs and wild honey, and they would choose to, and they would be sustained calorically by that. As John embraces this call to be part of Jesus' kingdom, he chooses to identify with the people in the depths of the valley that Christ is going to raise up and put in equality with kings and queens and princes in this world. This is an incredible moment where John chooses downward mobility for the sake of others and his ability to identify and be present with them. John embraced his call as a wilderness prophet to live like the people he was sent to. And I love John. Because John's main message wasn't, you're a sinner, you need to repent. John's message was, the Messiah, the King's coming, get ready. Right? We live in such an informal world. Guys, in the ancient world, if you were going to see a king, like, it would blow your mind. You would have to dress a certain way. You would talk a certain way, right? You think like there might be a lot of rules at grandma's house at Thanksgiving, like no elbows on the table, like use your napkin, right? Don't be gross, right? But in the ancient world, to see a prince or a king or a queen was to see God's very self in many places. His call to repentance was a call and a response to the good news that God's kingdom's coming and indeed already here in one sense. And then in verse 5 and 6, so keep moving along with me, we see what the effect was of John's proclamation of the good news. So let's read this together in verse 5 and 6. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptizing him in the river Jordan and confessing their sins. I'm just going to read that one more time. This is a weird dude in the wilderness doesn't shower, eats bugs, scavenges for honey, tells people they're sinners. There you go. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Does it seem weird to anyone else besides me? seems bizarre to me. Like in my fleshly self, right, if I'm going to go see someone, like I hope they don't smell bad and I hope they don't eat bugs most of the time, right? Right? But there's this man proclaiming the gospel and there's something so incredible about that good news that the normal human limitations that we have between us and other people are broken down by the power of the good news that the king is coming and there's hope for repentance and new life. People come from everywhere. They came and publicly did two things. They confessed their sins. Has anyone ever publicly in front of a large group of people confessed sins before? This was not like, sorry, Jesus, my bad. Right? This is, this is like clearly in the language that this is out loud in front of people like later in the New Testament says we're supposed to do as followers of Jesus, just so you know. He says part of our forgiveness and experiencing the fullness of God's forgiveness is being honest with other people about the places that we sin because they're not going to be surprised because we're all sinners saved by grace. That's the whole gospel. That's why the king came to fix our broken world. They came and in a shame-based culture, we've talked a lot about this, they said the shameful things that they had done 
and then got in dirty, nasty water, got dunked under like, a pro, like someone who was getting converted to Judaism at that time, and ask for God's forgiveness. When the gospel is proclaimed and the Spirit of God moves in people's hearts, that's the kind of transformative power that God moves and does. All right, let's finish it up. Verse 7. We'll read 7 to 12. But when he saw, being John, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, those were the religious leaders of the day, the two competing uh, religious uh, sects. We'll get more into them later on in Matthew. And he says this to them. Coming to his baptism, John said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The religious leaders, the theologians, the Bible scholars, and the pastors come out to see what the heck's happening, right? Because they see the people around them flocking to this man, asking them to confess their sins and be baptized. I just like John because he's consistent. Do you have anyone in your life who is just really steady? They always are who they are around all the people that they're with. And John wants the religious leaders to know and be ready for the kingdom to come. He wants them to turn from the ways in which they've corrupted the gospel for financial and social and political gain. And he's asking them to lay it down, confess their sin, and be baptized because he is bringing good news. John invites the local pastors to confess their sin and repent and follow him. And he invites them not just to do that in word, but indeed he's inviting them into this transformed place where they identify their own imperfection and be honest about the ways in which they struggle because in Jesus' kingdom, the weak are strong and everything is upside down. He tells these proud men who know their spiritual pedigree. They're related to Abraham, the one who God covenanted with. Just like for them is for us, the faith of our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents and our ancestors does not save us. It's a gift to us and a deposit of faith. Like, my faith does not save my three daughters. Right? But I pray that through that deposit of faith and the witness of the church, right, that they would one day follow Jesus and know Jesus and walk with him their whole life. He's asking these men who think that they're in with the king just because they were born into the right families of power and religious privilege, that that does not get you in to Jesus's kingdom. The right words, the right family members, it's nothing. The valleys raised up, the mountains come crashing down in this moment, and what we're going to find out is that for some of these people, they are unwilling to get off their high horse and their high mountain to see that the king has come. And he gives. And John, in great love, just like when I tell my children, hey, that's hot, don't touch it. Anyone ever done that before? Anyone's kid ever not listened to them before? Yes, any of us do that as an adult? Oh, if I do this thing, it's going to be terrible for me. 
I'm going to do it anyway. Case in point, everyone who goes to Taco Bell, right? It's terrible for you, right? But you, but you do it anyway, man. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, I work with some. Never mind. I'm not going to. It's not an important story at this point in life. <laughs> he warns them that this life and this kingdom that they are giving themselves to is getting overthrown and the king has come. And right now they're on top and he's warning them. If you will not worship this king, the reality is you have no place in his kingdom. There's one king in Jesus' kingdom, and it's none of us. He's warning them that this tree, that this life that you have built, if Jesus is not at the center of it, the axe is coming, and it will not last into eternity. It does not matter how well you trick the people around you in this life, unless in your heart you are seeking a repentant life, following Jesus, confessing your sin, sharing the gospel with people. Right? God calls us to this radical life where we lay down everything that we might find the thing that's worth everything we could even fathom. And then John ends with this incredible, humble, honest, and repentant view of himself and everyone else who isn't Jesus. He says that he might baptize with water. But Jesus is going to baptize this one who comes after him. It's going to be Jesus. I'll ruin the story. You can read three verses on and find out. Right? The one to come, it's Jesus. And he's going to baptize with something that changes you forever. That this baptism that Jesus brings is going to refine you. I don't know if you've ever watched something being smelt. But smelt, that's the right word, when you melt metal. Right? When you melt metal... All of this, I can't remember this. What's the stuff called that comes to the top? Slag. Slag? Slag. Yeah. When you're burning metal and purifying it, a bunch of stuff comes out, and you have to continually scoop it off to purify it. He's letting them know that as the Spirit of God comes, and that baptism comes, and you enter that kingdom, that you will be changed. And reminds them that in Jesus' kingdom, in Christ, we will be a new creation. That the old will pass and the new will come. I want to let you know that this shoe thing is a big deal. No sewers in the ancient world. They walk on roads where animals walked and people took care of business. It's disgusting. In, in, in a wealthy Hebrew household, you would not allow a Hebrew slave to take off your sandal because it was so disrespectful. You would have to have a non-covenantal person take off your shoe because it was such a low task. It was the lowest possible task that any single person could have in Israel. And he says that this king that is coming who brings this good news of repentance, is so wondrous that I am unworthy to take off his poop-covered, disgusting, despicable shoe that only the lowliest servant, if they were Hebrew, wouldn't even be able to touch. He sees himself just like everybody else. And there's often a temptation for us as followers of Jesus when we see something wrong with other people, we're like, oh, you have a speck in your eye. Like there's a two by four sticking out of your left eye. They're like, you said a bad word once. Let me tell you why you're a terrible person and Jesus hates you forever, right? And unless you act perfectly all the time, you'll have no place in Jesus's kingdom. It's not how it works. He sees himself as the least. And he gets at the end of the day, when we take this posture of repentance, we get to see who we really are and the people around us really are and who God truly is. I don't know if you know this. Sometimes people can be a little bit judgy. Anyone ever experienced that or done that before? I've for sure done that before, right? 
humans have a proclivity to think that we are the king and that we get to pass final judgment on other people. I'm going to tell you, you're wrong because you have no idea what someone else's heart is. You, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say this one more time. You have no idea what's going on in someone else's heart. You can barely fathom your own. Don't try to guess what's going on in someone else's. And the second that we do, we move ourselves from a repentant heart to standing as the king and saying, I am judge, jury, and executioner in Jesus' kingdom. Unless you agree with me, you're out. And John here models this incredible, humble moment where he acknowledges that it is Christ and Christ alone, the perfect, just judge. Are there, are there perfect, just judges in this world other than Jesus? It's, it's, it's impossible. We were born with a nature that was broken from the beginning. There's this incredible moment. And he says that this perfect judge, okay, I've never threshed grain, but I read about it in a book. So I'm gonna, if you've actually threshed grain, help me out. So they take these forks, like a pitchfork, throw it in the air, and the outside of the kernel fly away, and the actual kernel itself falls down to the ground, and the, sh the outside of the wheat and the inside are separated. That somehow God in his perfect wisdom at the end of all days knows who's in the kingdom and who's out and is it our responsibility to decide who's in and out? No, because many people, Jesus later on will say, many people did miracles in my name and everyone celebrated them and they're far from me because God knows our hearts. John didn't just preach the gospel of repentance to other people. He preached it to himself first. It's like being a pastor and standing up front. Every single one of these things, like, I have to wrestle with. And like, oh, good. I get to walk up and say, hey, everyone, your pastor's a sinner saved by grace. And I struggle with sin and temptation and not wanting to do good things. And, and I'm really good at doing bad things. And that's my nature. And by God's grace, God is making me new. And there's a hope in the midst of my imperfections, just like there is for you. In this moment, the first echoes of this kingdom of heaven are rallying around in Matthew's gospel. And at the core and the entrance into that kingdom is this posture of repentance that affects us as individuals, that changes the way we see God, changes the way we see ourselves, and changes the way we see the people around us. So as we finish today, and the worship team comes up, and we drop the lights down to have like a little more reflective moment, I want to encourage you that as we choose repentance, it deeply changes the way we understand ourselves. It deeply changes the way that we connect with God. I'm going to give you some examples. If we know that we are sinners saved by grace, is it hard to rush back to God when we mess up? If God knows that that's our character, and the king says, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from you, for I am gentle and humble. If that's God's invitation, when we mess up, do we need to like skip church for a month? and get everything together before we come back? Do we think we have to say all the right things before God will move in our life? Do we need to have it perfectly together to share the gospel with our neighbor? Because the gospel is not our perfection, but Christ's perfection in and through us. This posture of repentance transforms the way that we see God, and in the midst of our imperfection, the king says, come to me and I will give you forgiveness. It changes the way we see ourselves. Some people are a little hard on themselves. Can I get an amen if that's you? Right. Some people, just the second you mess up, you're like, oh, how could I, I'm, I'm done. I got nothing. Right, if the reality of ourselves that we are sinners saved by grace, does God know we're gonna mess up? Yes. Is God surprised and shocked when we messed up? No, why are we? If the gospel is that God has called us to repent, we should not be shocked when we sin. We should be shocked if we sin and don't run back to Jesus, 
right? Because that denies who our king is. But the reality is, in the midst of the struggles and the difficulty of a life, it doesn't excuse our sin. Our sin crucified our Lord. Perfect was killed for that. But understanding and embracing this posture of repentance changes how we see ourselves. And last, it changes how we see each other. Look around. Like, people say mean things. People say silly things. People don't call you when you need it. Sometimes as a parent, I want to treat my kid as an adult. Anyone do that? And expect them to do better than I do. And I think there's something about when we see everyone else around us as people in process, it's really hard to judge them. It's really hard to write them off. It's really hard to think they're worth it. It's really hard to trash them on the way home from church because of the way they dress or the things they said. Right? It changes everything when we believe the gospel of Jesus and we repent and follow him. I want to encourage you, if, if in one of these three areas, the Holy Spirit is inviting you to repent, I'm going to invite you to confess your sin, just like I've been doing all week long. It's horrible and wonderful, just like letting you know. Right? It's wonderful, because at the end of it, there's freedom. So if in one of these three areas, if you need to repent about who God is, who you are, or the way you see other people, I want to encourage you as we sing this last song, like you don't have to jump up and sing right away. Spend that time doing business with the Lord. Know that you have been forgiven so that you can forgive. Jesus, I'm thankful for each person here. Lord, we pray and we thank you for your good news of repentance. Lord, as we take time to be obedient to your call, would you receive our offering of ourselves? As we repent from the ways in which we have not believed your good gospel of repentance about yourself, about us and the people around us. Lord, receive our prayers and our confession as we lift them to you.